welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church Online. This week in worship, Pastor Dana looks at a timely topic about coming to church and experiencing things in person. Let's listen. Uh, This week we are continuing on in our sermon series on questions of our faith. And this week we have a very timely question. The question this week is how do I encourage others to come to worship and to learn things together? And I say this is a timely question because for many, many years, denominations across the spectrum have been watching church attendance lower and drop off. Churches throughout every denomination have been watching churches close their doors because attendance is lowering, because they can't meet the budget, because participation is dwindling. For most Protestant churches, this has been an issue for several decades, and there is a lot of speculation as to why this is occurring. For instance, Gallup reports that one reason we are seeing churches' attendance lower so drastically is because Americans' confidence in 14 historically important institutions are at a record low. Those institutions include the economy, politics, religion, and the media, research shows that the number of Americans expressing a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in the 14 institutions is only 33%. Newspapers and organized religion took the biggest hit. Newspapers dropped to 11%, and people's confidence in organized religion dropped to 10% in the past decade. So all of the institutions that at one point used to give us stability have unraveled. Consequently, people are not turning to the church anymore as a a source of moral guidance or as a source of truth or as a trustworthy institution, which means that we are living in an ever-increasing secular society. It means that we are living in a day and age where people are skeptical. They are skeptical about churches. They are skeptical about organized religion. And all of that research that I shared with you, all of that research was prior to COVID. COVID did not help church attendance in any way, shape, or form. From the time that the pandemic hit and churches were forced to close their doors. It was a long span of time before most churches could open safely again. For a lot of churches, it was over two years before they opened their doors. And well, that span of time created a lifestyle. You guys may have heard of the 2190 rule. The 2190 rule states that it takes 21 days to form a habit, and it takes 90 days to make that habit a permanent lifestyle. And while we far exceeded that 90-day mark from the time churches closed their doors until the time that they were opened again, And so it has been a slow trickle back. It's been a slow trickle to get people back in church, to get people in the pews again and worshiping in person. It has been a slow trickle to undo the lifestyle that COVID created, where we like to worship at home in our pajamas with our coffee, where it is easier to live stream on a Sunday morning because we don't feel like getting the kids dressed and then loaded into the car and then off to church. Trust me, I get it. I have an 18-month-old. But it's because of the lifestyle that COVID created and the skepticism about church and organized religion that was before the pandemic occurred. All of this leads me to say that our question this week is a very timely one. How do we encourage others to come and worship together so that we can learn things alongside of each other? Essentially, this is a question about evangelism, about evangelizing to others, getting them excited about church again. Our question this week begs us to help cultivate a new lifestyle in folks, to help cultivate a new lifestyle in our community around us, to help break the lifestyle that COVID created by encouraging people to come to church again. So how do we do that? Well, the Gospel of John had something to say about this topic. 
turning to John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42. It says, The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. In this passage of John, we hear about how John and two disciples are having an interaction with Jesus. And during that interaction, the two disciples start out by following Jesus once they hear that he is the Lamb of God. And after they start following Jesus, Jesus turns to them and he says, what do you want? What are you looking for? And they respond with a question. They say, where are you staying? And then Jesus says, come and see. All of this back and forth between Jesus and the disciples is important to note because in the Gospel of John, questions always have a double meaning. In the Gospel of John, questions are never quite as literal. They're never quite as direct and straightforward as they may seem. So when Jesus turned to Andrew and he says, what do you want? What are you looking for? Essentially, Jesus was saying, what are you looking for in life? What do you really want out of life? He was saying, Andrew, what is at the core of what you need to make you a happy, contented person? What are you really looking for? And when Andrew responded to that question with another question, he says, where are you staying? Well, that question didn't mean where are you staying in a literal sense. That doesn't mean, Jesus, are you staying at the Howard Johnson? Are you staying at Holiday Inn, the Ramada Inn? This question is being asked in the Gospel of John, so we have to take a deeper look at its double meaning. We have to look closely at the Greek words that are being used in this question. And the Greek word that was being used is mene. The Greek word mene translates as to stay, remain, live, dwell, abide, to be in a state that begins and continues, yet may or may not end or stop. So with this Greek word mene being used and the double meaning of the questions, all of that changes Andrew's question. The question then takes on a new meaning, and we can understand that to mean, where are you living and dwelling, Jesus? What lives and abides inside of you? What is it that gives you such life inside of you? Such life that does not stop or end. And after that question, that is when Jesus issues his invitation. Jesus says, come and see. As in, come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself because words cannot do it justice. Come and see for yourself because there are no metaphors, there are no parables, there are no flowery images that can fully describe and encapsulate what it is that lives and dwells and abides within me. There are no words to describe the kind of life and joy that is within. And really none of us can fully describe and express the Spirit of God that lives within us. It is exceedingly difficult to fully articulate the life, the joy, the love, and peace that we have because God's Spirit lives within us. We try hard to do that, uh, but we fall short at times. And we try hard to describe what it feels like to have a relationship with God. But if we are describing that to someone who is a non-believer, somebody that doesn't know what God's presence feels like, then it's even harder to articulate it and to explain it correctly. You just have to say to them, you'll have to come and see for yourself. They have to feel it and experience it firsthand before they truly know what it feels like, before you know how real and powerful God is. It's similar to taking a trip somewhere out of the country, somewhere beautiful and exotic, and when you come back from that trip, you're telling your friends and your family members all about it. 
You're gushing about how wonderful the trip was, how beautiful of a place it was. You show them pictures and maps, and you tell them about the food that you ate and everything that you did, but none of it will do it justice until they see it in person. No amount of pictures, maps, or flowery adjectives can replace what seeing, feeling, touching, and tasting a different country or culture is like in person. And Jesus knew that, which is exactly why he answered Andrew the way he did. That's why he said, come and see. Essentially, Jesus was saying, if you want to know what gives what lives and dwells and abides in me, if you want to know what gives me life and hope and peace, come and see for yourself. Recently, I was reading a list of some of the state slogans that are used across the country, and some of them I found to be quite interesting. Some of them are quite punny, Um, so I thought I would share some of those with you this morning. The first one is Arizona. The state slogan for Arizona is the Grand Canyon State, and while that one makes a lot of sense, um, California, the slogan for California is come find yourself here. That one makes a lot of sense uh, as well. Number three was Colorado. Their state slogan is enter a higher state, which seems to be a double entendre. I will let you parse that one out for yourself. Number four is District of Columbia. Their slogan is taxation without representation. Georgia is Georgia on my mind, the famous song by Ray Charles who hails from Georgia. Hawaii's state slogan is the Islands of Aloha, which also has a double meaning, as aloha means hello and goodbye. And while we know that the Hawaiians love to welcome their tourists, but they also love to say goodbye to them as well. Idaho's state slogan is great potatoes and tasty destinations. North Carolina, our slogan is a better place to be, which I definitely agree with that one. South Dakota, their slogan is great faces and great places. This is the home of Mount Rushmore. Washington's state slogan was say what, which I just thought was pretty punny. And then my favorite was New Jersey. Their state slogan is come see for yourself. Now, my husband, Matt, is from New Jersey, and so I was a little bit interested to learn a little bit more about how they came up with this state slogan. So I did some research, and it turned out in that in 2006, the governor decided that he was going to take a poll. He was going to poll the citizens of New Jersey to see if they wanted to change their state slogan and to see what they wanted to change it to. And so 11,000 people voted to change the state slogan, and they voted in favor of the new Come and See for Yourself slogan. New Jersey officials stated that this new slogan would help to highlight the Garden State's true beauty. Since New Jersey is home to more than 9,700 farms, there's 715,000 acres of farmland in New Jersey. And I can attest that you do have to go to New Jersey and see it for yourself. And when you go to New Jersey, you realize that it is not quite as bad as everyone has told you. It is not quite as dirty as you might think. In fact, I would go even as far to say that there are some pretty beautiful parts in New Jersey. There are beautiful farms, beautiful landscapes throughout South Jersey, areas that would make you think that you are back in rural North Carolina. Now, you are definitely not in North Carolina, but for a split second, you might think, am I back in North Carolina? So the 11,000 voters that voted in favor of the new slogan, well, they weren't wrong. New Jersey is a place that you will need to come and see for yourself. Now, even though New Jersey coined this new slogan in 2006, come and see for yourself, Jesus said it far before they did, long before they did. However, I think they both carry the same message. They both point out how it is hard to describe some things. They both imply that you just have to go and witness it firsthand before you truly know. You have to go to New Jersey before you know what it's like there, before you know what lives and dwells and abides in the state of New Jersey. 
It's hard to debunk the myths that we've heard about New Jersey, the, the stories that we've heard about the Jersey Shore, until we go and see it in person, before we go and experience it for ourselves. Likewise, it's hard to describe and truly articulate what it's like to experience God, what it's like to have a relationship with God. It's hard to describe and articulate what it feels like to have God's Spirit living and dwelling within us. You just have to see it. You have to experience it for yourself, and then you know, and then you believe. Here in this passage, Jesus invites everyone to consider who he is and therefore who God is by coming and seeing for themselves. And what happens after that is life-changing. It affected Andrew so much that after this encounter with Jesus, he left and found his brother Simon. He tells Simon all about Jesus. He evangelizes to Simon. And then he brings Simon back to Jesus so that Simon can come and see for himself, so that Simon can come and see for himself who Jesus is, what he is about, what he is like in person. And through that process, a new disciple was born. So this phrase, come and see for yourself, it becomes a wonderful model for all of us, a model about how we can share our faith with other people, a model about how to invite others to experience God and the Christian faith firsthand. It's a model about how to evangelize and encourage others to come to church so that we can learn things together. Now, I know that everyone uh, gets scared when they hear that word evangelize. This word evangelism, it creates this instant recoil inside. But evangelizing, it just simply means that we share our faith with someone else. To evangelize means that we preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel simply means we share good news. We share the good parts about our faith journey. We share our faith story with folks. So evangelizing doesn't have to be this scary word that creates dread within. It's just simply a word that means to invite others to come and see, to come and experience Jesus for themselves. And that is what our churches need today. That is what is needed in order to keep our churches alive and people in our pews. That is what is needed in order to keep the faith alive in people, to reinstill trust in folks about churches and organized religion. But we have to be willing to share our faith. We have to be willing to invite people to church and to other church events. We have to be willing to say, come and see. For yourselves. Recently, I was reading an article, and it pointed out how young adults are getting their information on the web, which is saturated with images and experiences and an overflow of incoming data. Consequently, our worship has little or no appeal because it is not multi-sensory. The article stated that worship that can be experienced through sight, sound, smell, touch, and movement is most moving and meaningful, which means we have to come and worship together in person. We have to come together and learn things with one another. We have to come to church so that we can feel and sense God's Spirit, so that we can gather around the Lord's table and smell and taste the communion elements. We have to come and sing our hymns together and move and sway with one another, perhaps even clap to one of them from time to time. Nothing compares to coming to worship on a Sunday morning and worshiping with our church family and experiencing it firsthand. So we have to be willing to remind folks of that feeling, reminding folks of the goodness that is present within the walls of the church inviting and encouraging people to come and experience it for themselves. And usually just simply saying things to someone, like, why don't you come to youth group on Sunday evening? Or my church is having a big children's event this Sunday. Why don't you and the kids come along? Or we have a new art installation here at Artisan. Come check out the artwork. Or there's an art reception. Come meet the artist one Thursday evening. 
usually the, these things are enough to get somebody interested in what we are doing at church. All of these are great ways to take the, this model that is outlined for us in our gospel reading and put it into practice to invite people to come and see for themselves that we're not scary Christians, to come and see for themselves the beauty that exists within the walls of the church, the beauty that exists with fellowship and church community, the beauty that exists in this world when we have a relationship with God. Come and see our simple, open, inviting words. This is not about forcing Jesus, forcing our religion, forcing our church on anyone. It's about being willing to say to someone in some small way, this is what God is doing in my life. This is what gives me life and hope. This is what my faith mean to me. And that simple invitation can be life-changing. So may we all utilize this model that Jesus gave us May we all start saying to folks, come and see for yourself because words cannot fully do it justice. Amen. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.org or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church podcast. Have a great week.